All right, welcome back to Mech 1320. We're getting into Chapter 6 now. Essentially, nuts and bolts for the most part, all right? So uh, everything here is going to reference Chapter 6 in the book, but let's go ahead and dive right in, okay? We're going to talk about the thread standard. There's two major thread standards uh, that we kind of use here. Uh, there's the Unified Screw Thread Standard. All right, we use that mainly here in the U.S. It's based off a 60-degree thread angle. And we'll get to what that means here in a second. Okay, so there's the Unified National Core Series and the Unified National Fine Series. Okay, the Core Series, that's the most common series that we have. It's bolts, screws, nuts, general applications, quick assembly, and that sort of things. If we use a Unified Series, okay, they're used for handling high tensile stresses or strains or those sort of things, or when the length of engagement is limited, uh, such as screws and thin walls and those type of things, okay? And then we have a unified national special series as well. We have the international screw thread standard, okay? That one's the most common, and it's based on 60-degree thread angle. That one's obviously going to be more metric if we go. Okay. So if we get into terminology here, so before, right, we talked about the, the ISO one being 60 degrees. We can see where that is on here, okay? If we look at the thread angle on the picture that I have, the thread angle is at a 45 in the picture right here. We'll see where the chamfer type is. But if that's not the thread angle, you can see down below where the actual thread angle is. That's the angle between the two threads as it goes. Now. That's where we're going to base it, at the very bottom of the picture. But we can look at the chamfer there and see where it's at. It sits at 45 on this one. The pitch, okay, that's the distance between threads, okay? So notice the two arrows on the pitch on the diagram here. We should be looking from the top of one thread to the top of the other thread. That's the pitch, okay? When we rate these, we talk about the number of threads per inch, Okay, and then we break it down into we have the, the minor diameter and the major diameter. You know, think of minor as the smaller diameter, the major diameter as the bigger diameter. So the minor diameter is the diameter between where the groove sits in, okay? Where that angle thread is at the very bottom of the groove, that's the minor diameter. The major diameter is the outer diameter. Then if we get into it, the mean diameter, okay, obviously the mean is the average between those two. The lead, that's the distance the screw thread advances in one revolution. So as I turn a screw, all right, how far it advances into the hole or out of the hole, depends on if you're right, turning counterclockwise or clockwise, that's how far it goes. The thread fit, that's how tight the thread engagement is. There's three classes of fit, okay? There's unified, loose, medium, and tight fits, okay? We use the loose, medium, and tight fits for this. So if we take a look in our book, all right, A for external and B for internal fits, okay? External would be on the outside of the screw. The internal fit would be on, like, the inside of a nut. All right, so let's take a look at this example here. If here's how we kind of label them, per se. We have a quarter, 20 UNC BX1. So what does all that mean? It indicates that the thread with an outer diameter of a quarter inch, okay, with 20 threads per inch, okay, and the type of thread is UNC, right, the coarse one. And since it's B, it's an internal fit and the thread length of one inch, okay? If we look at the metric one, we have a 10M, or I'm sorry, an M10 times, or X, or however you want to see that, right? 1.56G. So what that indicates is it's a metric thread with an outer diameter of 10 millimeters, a pitch, remember that's the distance between the threads, of 1.5 millimeters. The fit of the thread is 6G, okay? So there's a whole chart that you can go through and that sort of thing and learn to read the stamps on the ends of the bolts and stuff as well. Okay, but we use two words interchangeably, bolts and screws, but they're not really the same. 
Okay, yes, they both have threads, but a bolt, we use a nut on the end as depicted here in the picture, okay? Screws, we don't put nuts on, and screws tend to have generally a pointed end, right? We, you know, we use metal screws, there's wood screws and different things like that, but the screw drives itself in and locks that way, where when we use a bolt, generally we have a pre-existing hole, all right, and we put the bolt through, and we lock it on the other end, with using a nut. So they are not the same, but sometimes people use them interchangeably. Let's talk about a few nuts and bolts here. All right, you're gonna need to recognize these pictures on, a home, on your homework and on your test and that sort of thing. But the first one we have is a carriage bolt. We use it to fasten to metal and to wood, and it's you know, uniquely defined by the square under the head uh, that actually locks it and keeps it from turning. We also put a nut on it, but the square part is under the head. That's how we define it as a carriage bolt. We also have machine screws, okay, very thi fine threads and things like that. Uh, we use them for you know vehicle bodies and metal sheets and that sort of thing. We have sheet metal screws. All right, those actually you know they're pointed at the end and kind of drive their own hole where. Machine screws above, right? We have a hole already made for them that they have to fit into and tighten to. Uh, next ones that we're going to work a lot with in here are the set screws. Generally, they have no head. It's really just, you know, a, uh, a standard screwdriver that you use on those and you drive those in. So we use those to lock pulleys, gears, and shafts, all right, or onto shafts, sorry, um, when we do that. And you guys, you're going to do a lot of that in your lab. Uh, making sure that everything is tightened down. Those just screw down and essentially use friction on there to hold everything on. We have a socket head screw. It's the strongest head style um, because, it, you know, it's generally a hex. So we're using an Allen wrench, and they don't strip as easily as all the other types of screws. It doesn't mean they can't strip, all right, especially if you're using a power tool, but they tend to be the strongest and have the most longevity. All right, if we take a look at different bolts here, we have a stud, which is a standing bolt. Okay, there's threads on both ends. One screws in permanently to, and then the other one we uh, put the nut on. Okay, so you might have one of those to hold up a pole or something like that as well. Uh, you know, they'll be sticking up out of the concrete, and then you put like a light on top of it and bolt it down. We have a hex through bolt. That one goes all the way through the hole, and we put a nut on the end. And then we have an anti-fatigue bolt. Okay, we reduce the shank down uh, for which shocking in a load occurs. Okay, so it doesn't snap as easily. All right, on to the nuts. We just got through all the bolts. We are on to the nuts piece. So we have hex nuts. Obviously, hex is right a hexagonal shape. And a hexagon shape has six sides to it. Okay, so that's... How we classify those. We have castle nuts, okay? They look a little bit, you know, like a rook or a castle on the end there. Uh, we use those in applications where there's heavy vibrations, you know, on wheels and things like that. Uh, they can only handle light torques, though, obviously, because they're not quite as strong. Uh, we use wing nuts. Uh, if we look at our CNC mill back there, uh, we use, you know, wing nuts so that we can quickly uh, clamp things down. Uh, we have a cap or an acorn nut, all right? So that way, um, you know, it's covered, covering the screw on the end up. So you put those on, so like, you know, you go buy like a swing set from Walmart or something. Uh, you put all the cap nuts on so that, uh, you know, no one cuts themselves on the bolt that's sticking up or things along those lines, okay? We also have fastener locking devices, all right? So that we can, we wanna be able to keep that, that nut from uh, loosening or the bolt from loosening. So we use different friction locking based devices here. So we have a spring lock washer. Notice that you know it's popped up and it's cracked and it's cracked on one side. So as you tighten the nut down onto the bolt, it also pushes that down and locks it in course with the friction. Okay. We also have a lock washer. Okay. The spring lock washer is a, generally a, just a lock washer as well, but. We have an internal tooth lock washer, an external tooth lock washer, and we have safety wires. So if one, you know, turns one way, 
it'll actually tighten the other one and they'll tighten each other back and forth when you use safety wires. Those are all friction-based locking devices. We have non-friction-based locking devices, okay? So we have split pins and carter pins and things like that. Uh, some of you guys, if we did the Bobots or things like that, how we put the, the wheel on it. Um, you know, if we go over to the mechanical trainer, we use a bunch of carter pins and things like that to hold, you know, our gears on and our sheaves on and that sort of thing. Okay, and we have nut lock plates and tab washers. All right, tab washers actually sit down into whatever you're sticking them on with that one little tab or lock piece, all right, that prevents that nut from turning around. If we have a nut lock plate, right, it fits nicely around the nut, so no matter what, that nut will not uh, come out. And a nut lock plate doesn't always look like that. It can be like, you know, countersunk in as well, so as you turn it around, um, and you'll put it locks down in as well. All right, so let's just get through some common questions you might see on a homework or a test or those sort of things. What are the two thread standards that we talked about? The unified screw thread system and the isometric thread standard, okay? Let's thoroughly describe this bolt that's given by 1 quarter 28 UNF 2A, okay? Just based on what we talked about a few slides back. All right, the bolt has an outer diameter of a quarter of an inch. It's a fine thread. The 28 represents threads per inch, and it's unified national fine thread series. It has a medium fit with an external thread. Remember, the A is the external. All right, let's describe the next one. Obviously, it's metric. Okay, so we have M10 by 1.25, so that means what? The outer diameter is 10 millimeters, and it has a pitch of 1.25 millimeters. All right, if we have a thread that has, this is on a test, okay, and it's on your homework. If a thread has 40 threads per inch, what is its pitch? This is how we have to calculate that in one inch divided by 40. So its pitch, remember the distance between threads, is 0 0.025. Everything's gauged off of one inch in this case, okay? Now, is each of the screw locking devices below friction-based or not? Okay, just remember from a few slides ago, okay, we got our, our spring lock, yes. Okay, our safety wires, in this case, no. Actually, um, yes, they actually are. This is a misprint on this one. They are under the friction piece. Uh, the next, okay, the lock nut, no, right? Next, lock washer, yes. And the Carter pin is a no. All right, then moving on to the last slide here in the lecture. What component is shown in this figure? And if you said a castle nut, you are correct. All right, and remember, castle nuts apply to where we have common vibrations or things like that. All right, guys, well, that rounds out Chapter 6. That's all about nuts and bolts that you ever wanted to know. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to email me, else I'll see you in class.